Welcome to the Maria Liberati Show, where food meets art, travel, and life. So what does food mean to you? Well, join me today as my special guest is author Cynthia Ehrenkrantz, who wrote the book, seeking shelter and Cynthia is going to not only talk to us about this memoir but um, recipes that she has that are in this memoir that are very similar to the peasant kitchen cooking that I'm always talking about and she's going to tell us some recipes from this time period that her memoir is from. Today, we're just stepping back in time past the fancy restaurants and gleaming kitchens to the heart of the home, the peasant kitchen. Join me as we explore the ingenuity, resourcefulness, and sheer magic of cooking from scratch with little more than what the land and community provided. Cynthia is going to give us a little picture of what it was like cooking in this time period. You know, it was during World War II, and that was really the height of the peasant kitchen, although there was also um, recipes that were developed in the peasant kitchen in Italy way before then as well because of necessity. So if you can imagine a bustling kitchen, smoke curling from the chimney, the rhythmic clatter of wooden spoons against clay pots, sunlight streaming through a small window illuminating a humble spread of vegetables grains and perhaps a few precious cuts of meat this is the world of the peasant kitchen where every ingredient was treated with reverence every scrap utilized in every meal was a celebration of survival and community but you know, peasant kitchens were not just about scarcity. They were bursting with creativity and resourcefulness. Grains like wheat, barley, and millet took center stage, transformed into loaves, porridge, and even pasta like noodles. Vegetables fresh or preserved brought color and vitamins. Herbs gathered wild or lovingly cultivated infused dishes with fragrance and subtle complexities. And don't forget the role of fire. Open hearths and wood-fired ovens were more than just cooking tools. They were the heart of the home, gathering families and nurturing stories alongside sig sizzling stews and uh, rising breads. So stick with me for this interesting and intriguing interview with Cynthia Ehrenkrantz, the author of Seeking Shelter. And and listen to some interesting recipes that you can try at home. There are actually two that you're probably gonna, going to want to try at home that would be worth trying. And if you do try the recipes, if you like them, please take a photo. If you make a variation of the recipe, let us know. Take a photo, hashtag it, the Maria Liberati Show. Put it on social media and we will put it on the website the Maria Liberati Show.com. Welcome to the Maria Liberati Show, where food meets art, travel, and life. Today, my special guest is Cynthia Ehrenkrantz, and she is the author of a really interesting book called Seeking Shelter. And uh, well, we're going to talk about this interesting book, but we're going to talk about some recipes as well. You know, we always do food talking here on the Maria Liberati show. We always manage to figure a way to get food in. Anyway, Cynthia, thank you so much for being here today. Well, thank you for inviting me. <laughs> Cynthia, so tell us a little bit, uh, give us a quick synopsis about Seeking Shelter. Uh, well, Seeking Shelter is a memoir of my life up to age 12, uh, and uh, and it covers the time of the, uh, World War II. Uh, I was six when the war began, and I was 12 when it ended. So that uh, that is a good time to have childhood memories. Yes. Um, and uh, uh, so I lived. Um, I, I lived in the London area, so I was uh, part of the time in the Blitz. Uh -huh. I was evacuated several times, sent away from the bombing, mm -hmm. and then 
1944, there were flying bombs. Uh, that were um, uh, unmanned rockets that were sent uh -huh. over. Many of them landed in my hometown. And um, 162 of them landed in Croydon, my hometown, which is uh, south of London proper. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, so that's the period that's covered in my book. Right. And it's told very much from a child's point of view. And for a child, uh, and for anybody, food is very important. Yes. But uh, of course, food became very central for us um, uh, during that period. Yes. Um, rationing started in 1940, um, and so that we were very limited in supplies of uh, certain foods, and rationing became more and more stringent as uh -huh. the war went on. Yeah. So we had to make do with uh -huh. a lot of things that were in short supply. Right. I I, I could not ever remember seeing a banana uh, oh because we weren't importing food. We were encouraged to grow our own. Right. My, my parents kept chickens. Uh -huh. uh, we had our own eggs. So we always had plenty of eggs. And we registered our ration books as vegetarian uh -huh. uh, um, because uh, my father believed in vegetarianism. He was a health nut way before. Oh, way before his first. time. He was right. before his time. He yes. Felt, he felt vegetarianism was more healthy. And uh, he uh, and so when rationing came in, if you got meat on uh, for your ration, each person got about half a pound of meat per week. Uh -huh. Well, that's like four hamburgers. Oh, my uh, and we uh, we did eat mostly vegetarian we had uh, meat on on occasion right. but if you registered as a vegetarian you were entitled to about a pound of cheese per person per week also you got nuts when they became available and uh, so my mother became a um uh, an expert quite an expert vegetarian cook uh -huh. and um, and, and we used eggs as um as a main meal very often right. Right. Uh, and of course, we could make lots of stuff with cheese. Yes. Same time, the government was issuing all kinds of guidelines uh, for healthy eating. Uh -huh. uh, and it's ironic that during the war, uh, people in England um, were healthier than they had ever been before or since. Um, the, uh, we were encouraged to grow our own vegetables. Uh -huh. It was very little meat. Yes. And however, um, because of the shortages and also the general blandness of British food, I right. mean, you know, it's yes. not, it's far, far removed from a, uh, from a Mediterranean diet. Yes. Yes. Uh -huh. So the government, uh, it issued lots of, um, uh, recipe pamphlets. Uh -huh. I, um, so when I give book talks, I have recipes in my book. Yes. And when I give book talks to book groups, they say, oh, we'll make some of the recipes. And I say to them, no, don't do that. They were disgusting. Said, so uh, uh, what? Uh, for instance, because we never saw a banana, yes. uh, there was a recipe called mock bananas. And my mother made it for me. Uh-huh. Mock bananas, you boiled parsnip uh -huh. and then you mashed it huh? and uh, you added a little sugar uh -huh. and then you added banana essence. Ah, uh, um, yes. It was horrible. I thought, what was all this fuss about bananas? Yes. It was, it was really horrible. And, and another recipe that's in the book uh -huh. is for something called Lord Walton Pie. Uh-huh. Lord Walton was the Minister of Food. Right. And he uh, suggested this pie with uh, vegetables that were plentiful. Uh huh. The crust was made of mashed potato and whole wheat flour. Okay. It came out a little bit like cardboard. Um, <laughs> and the filling uh -huh. uh, was turnips, parsnips, rutabagas, uh -huh. and potato. Uh huh. Well, it was the recipe was developed by the chef from the Strand Hotel, which is a grand hotel in London. Yes, yes. So people took to it with gusto, but they wrote letters to the Times and said that it was horrible and it was disgusting. 
I do have some recipes in the book that are for things that, uh, that my uh, my mother made that, uh -huh. that I still make today. Like, tell, can you tell us one, like, tell us one thing that, because, you know, I just want to digress for a minute. I know in, in Italian cooking, there was a period which was probably around the Second World War, where they developed, they call it peasant kitchen. And they used what, just like you're saying, they could only use the things that they grew and I'm not sure if the government gave them anything, but they were they were given land and were told to grow their own things and all that. So they had to really work in the kitchen with leftover things. They didn't throw anything away. So it can't, you know, it's the type of the same type of thing. And some of the recipes from this peasant kitchen is called Cucina Povide, are served today in some of the most expensive restaurants. So yes, because yes. they really had to had to be so creative in figuring how do we make these leftovers or these limited ingredients taste really, you know, into something really good, a great recipe. So tell us um, a recipe that we might want to make today that maybe your mom made. Uh, well, one of uh, one of the things that um, that my mother made and that I still make today uh -huh. was green, green tomato chutney. Now we we try to grow tomatoes, but the British summer is very cold and rainy yes. generally, and yes. they don't. And and you're left at the end of the summer with a lot of green tomatoes. Uh -huh. And uh, so basically, it, it's you you dump it all in a pot. You you cut up a lot of green tomatoes and apples, which were plentiful because uh -huh. apple trees are all over England. Yes. Um, apples and um, onions. Mm -hmm. uh, for a long time in uh, at the beginning of the war, there was a great shortage of onions because mm -hmm. we import them from France. But we grew. But by uh, 1942 or so, my onions had become more fl plentiful. Um, onions and garlic, uh, sugar, uh -huh. and um, and vinegar. And we use. And when I make it today. I look in the supermarket for malt vinegar. It has a particular flavor. Yes. Uh, it's uh, made, instead of make, being made from wine, it's made from uh, the malt that's used for beer, which is yes. much more national drink in England. Yes. And boil it all up together. It makes the house smell like a pickle factory. Okay. And uh, And you boil it all up together until it's the consistency of jam. Uh -huh. uh, because of the amount of vinegar in there, you do not need to um, uh, to uh, put it in a preserving pan, which, you know, when you make jam, you, you have yes. to uh, make sure that uh, that there's a proper seal, etc. Yes, because yes. Of the amount of vinegar, it's well preserved and you uh, and we save jars. Uh -huh. from uh, and my mother would just put it in jars um, with a little um, wax disc, which you can buy today in yes. the hardware store when they're they're selling uh, jars for canning. Yes, and and uh, and uh, and it keeps the whole winter uh, until the next summer when the green tomatoes are available again. Wow. Now that I'm in the States, mm -hmm. um, I ask people, friends who are growing tomatoes, if they'll give me um, their leftover green ones at the end of the summer. Oh, yes. And then I give each of them a jar mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, as a Very thank nice. you. For, uh, for oh, the, that's so nice. Yes, yeah. Really um, nice. Very nice. And another thing that my mother used to make, I, I – I think it, I I think this recipe is in the book. It was she would um she would poach eggs in a ramekin, uh huh, and, and bake them in the oven, uh huh, uh, uh, with um with a fresh slice of tomato on the bottom, the egg on the top, and then grated cheese on top of that, mm -hmm. and that like a main dish. And we would have it with rice or with potatoes. Exactly, and, and so. Um, contrary to you know people feeling really sorry for us, yes, uh, we were uh, we as as you said uh, the government gave people what are called allotments, yes. which were the local parks, yes. which would go up and that 
that still stays today. That remained after the war. Huh? Uh, I have friends uh, who have smaller gardens. Yes. And uh, they have an allotment uh, that's in um, a, a sort of wasteland. Uh -huh. uh, they grow vegetables. Nowadays, a lot of people also grow flowers. And uh, there are some people who have their allotments are full of dahlias. They're quite uh -huh. beautiful. Oh, and, that's wonderful. Yes. And, and so that, because the British are, are wonderful gardeners. Yes, uh, yes. Yeah. And Yes, uh, I know. I always see in some of my favorite TV series, they talk about, you know, their allotment and you'll see them, you know. So I know that's still something that's going on. But that's wonderful and, that you had yeah. that so that you can grow your own. And, you know, in the U.S. today, more and more people are starting to realize, you know, that that is a good thing for many reasons to grow yes. their own and, yes, and yes. Uh, try a variety of dishes with the things that they grow. But those recipes sound wonderful. Yes, really delicious dishes. I like the, the chutney sounds really, really interesting. So we'll have to, uh, we'll have to definitely try that and right. tell us, um, so tell us, Cynthia, where can we find your book? It it has been released, right? You did. Release oh yes, yes. yes uh, it it's awesome. available on Amazon, both as a paperback and as a Kindle, or okay. you can order it from your local bookstore. Uh, I love to support local bookstores. Yes, and, yes. Uh, you can order it, and um, and I have done um talks on it on Zoom uh -huh. or. So that I'm available, you know, if people are interested all over the country. Yes. Uh, it has a, a lot about uh, my experiences, both as an evacuee in the in the countryside right. and my grandparents uh -huh. and um, and uh, and uh, about what it's like to experience uh, bombing um, uh -huh. yeah. uh, as a child. Mm -hmm. And uh, we had. Uh, it's called Seeking Shelter yes. um, uh, because uh, we had different kinds of uh, uh, air raid shelters. Yes. The, first, the first one we had was like Harry Potter, the uh -huh. cupboard under the stairs, uh -huh. uh, where we uh, we sheltered in the, uh, the early air raids. And then my father built um, a shelter in the backyard that was made from corrugated iron. Oh, my he, gosh. Uh, uh, the supplies were supp uh, were available through the government very cheaply. Yes, uh, very unpopular those shelters. They were called Anderson shelters uh -huh. because the British climate is not great for camping out. Oh yes, uh, it was very damp and cold. Yes, and then towards the end of the war, we had a shelter inside the house that was called a Morrison shelter that was like a huge cast iron table uh -huh. and we stepped under it. And if your house was bombed mm -hmm. because it had a kind of a wire uh, enclosure, you were assured of an air supply um, uh, because the, uh, the cast iron was so strong uh -huh. that, uh, that people could dig you out from the rubble. Oh my goodness. Uh, very it interesting. Was, it was very, um, it was a time when people became very resourceful and there was a great sense of morale. Of, yes, yes. Um, you know that keep calm and carry on. Poster. Yes, yes, yeah. that, that saying. And I, I know when I've, you know, my first times in Italy, people were telling me experiences about, you know, during the Second World War and the stories were fascinating, not always stories that you want to hear, but just very fascinating and very interesting, the experiences of, you know, what happened there. It's different than just reading from a book that, you know, from maybe someone that didn't have the real experience where you're also giving a firsthand experience. Thank you so much, Cynthia. So much, much, much good luck with with this book. And if you do yeah. a follow up, please, please let us know. And just to remind my listeners that this will also be, if you're listening to us now, this will also be on YouTube shortly. So you can 
see us on video on YouTube as well. Thank you so much for, for being here, Cynthia. And thank you for listening to the Maria Liberati show. Thanks so much. Thank you, Maria. It was a pleasure. It okay. was a pleasure. Thank you. Thanks for listening to the Maria Liberati Show. And thanks as always to my producer, Britton Roselle, and author, Cynthia Ehrenkrantz of Seeking Shelter. And thanks to her for sharing with all of us her memoir and those lovely recipes from that era also. Hopefully you'll all get to try those. And if you do, as mentioned, please share photos of the recipes and hashtag them The Maria Liberati Show, and we will share them on the website, themarialiberatishow.com. And uh, coming up in the next few weeks, or actually the next 10 days, probably, we're going to have an interview. You know, it's National Pizza Day on February 9th. So Rocco, who is a regular, he's a Neapolitan pizza pizza expert and he's from Rocco's Dough and he will be giving us some tips on making pizza and making Neapolitan pizza. He always gives us these yummy tips on how to make your pizza tastier and just tips on uh, making the best pizza. So stay tuned for that recipe for Rocco's appearance um, for our, that's probably our next podcast because National Pizza Day is February 9th. So that will be for next week. Rocco from Rocco's Dough will be here. And also I just want to mention because you know we do cover art and I wanted to mention for those of you that may be in the Philadelphia area if you love stained glass there is a special stained glass event taking place on February 17th in Doylestown Pennsylvania at the National Shrine of Our Lady of Chestahova they are bringing in some special vintage stained glass that was rescued from an old church in Philadelphia and they're bringing it into the shrine and they are having um, the artist that that is helping to restore this he will be there um, speaking about how he did the restoration it's really really interesting and that's on february 17th it's at the national shrine of our lady of chestahova in doylestown pa check it out i'll probably be sharing it on social media also and as always you can find me at marialiberati.com on instagram at maria liberati on facebook at chef maria liberati on pinterest at maria liberati on youtube on our channel the maria liberati show.com you know you can find lots of videos of these audio podcasts right there so you can see us in living color on our youtube on my youtube channel and also on vimeo which is on vimeo it's just look up maria liberati and as always you can find my gourmand world award-winning cookbook at the the whole series rather is on art of living primamedia.com on maria liberati.com on amazon kindle anywhere books are sold and if it's not in your bookstore just ask them to get the book series, The Basic Art of Italian Cooking. And, or you can always email us at info at marialiberati.com. Until next time, peace, love, and pasta.